Welcome to Quest Givers. I'm the DMG, and with me is DM Scotty and our collaborative work, The North Road. And we're going to do a massive page through. I'm going to leave timestamps with each adventure down in the description so you'll be able to click on and go forward to each one as you wish. But really, just a thank you to everyone who backed our Kickstarter, who made this a reality. Um, this has been an absolutely wonderful adventure for ourselves. And everything we are as people and as game masters and everything has been kind of poured into this. So if you want to know what it's like to be playing in a DM Scotty DMG game, this is what it's like playing in our games. <laughs> So with that, Scotty, have you got any initial thoughts on, or things to say about this precious little book? <laughs> yeah, it was just, it, it's always been a dream of mine to do something like this, to make a book that, you know, people could uh, enjoy and run for their own table. And I'm, I'm just so proud of the work we've done. I, I think it's, I think it's great. And I think, you know, if you're, you know, into, um, you know, exciting adventures, interesting adventures that don't necessarily, you know, are, are, you know, off the, off the beaten path. I think it's just funny because this is North Road. <laughs> you should check, you should check the book out because there's a lot of fun packed in this book. So I think we'll start off with the actual, like the style and design of what we wanted to put into the book. Um, I, I did the cover art and the layout of the book and Scotty did most of the interior art and the photography and everything. So as we go through, we'll talk a little bit about each of those. Um, but Scotty, give us an idea of why we went with this style. Um, we really wanted to um, bring out the old school kind of book, that, that black and white, that stark black and white look. We have a lot of black and white images um, in the book. And um, I think it's really striking the cover with the yellow. You know, it's really striking, uh, and it reminds me of an old of an old game book. You know, which we're all we have all this old fond remembrances. Uh, and you know, look at the style of the book. It looks like a book from the '80s or '90s. You know, it's um, look at like an old game book. So I love that. I love the look of it. We also went with like a. It's sort of something you found in your parents' attic or their basement. So it's like exactly a pre loved book. So we've got like pre-damaged spine and <laughs> there's like bits and pieces of like old post-it notes and things inside. So that's really sort of our design aesthetic. And I'd just like to point out, this is my personal copy and there's a little bit of a ding in the corner, but it doesn't actually matter because it adds to the aesthetic of the book. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the, any, any damage you do to the book actually adds to the, to the, the, the ambience of the book. So, <laughs> so we've, helped we've you got out. stains. We've got stains in the book. We've got, you know, pencil shavings and stuff. It's fun. Uh, we wanted to make it look like this book that had been used, um, you know, lovingly used to run games. So the cover is the actual North Road and it kind of passes through all the little, so the beginning village and then the, the next city and then the other cities, the Temple Mountain and the final castle. Uh, the concept of the moon is in there. Uh, you're, there's four characters, there's a character whose leg you're looking past who's holding a sword. There's a wizard, there's a fighter and there's a ranger. Um, so you get the idea of, you know, this is a, a long trek through a, a, a realm. So that we'll begin with the trek. Um, so this is the interior cover, which sort of details a bit about who we are. If you don't know who we are, you can buy the book and find out. <laughs> <laughs> or there is also the PDF version, but this isn't in the PDF version. So yeah. um, obviously just the standards, you know, who did this and why we printed it where. Um, and here is the list of the adventures. So there are 16 adventures in here. There's 12 full-sized quests and four um, quick quests, we call them. So they usually are something that can be done in one session. And the other ones can sometimes go up to three sessions. So, Scotty, you've run it more than I have. And I think, you know, there are some that can run for quite a few sessions. Um, and then there's also an appendix at the end of the book, which details um, a little bit more about the world if you're interested but you get a you get a very good idea of it as as it reads through so this is the first module death and taxes this is my artwork and this is the tax collector <laughs> who we will meet <laughs> uh, that was quite a lot of fun drawing that because that was the first module we put out as quest givers so it was a, a lot of fun doing that um, 
and uh, each module has a list of the different events that happen because they're event driven uh, driven it's an event driven narrative so scotty winter bay what 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 do we do that's slightly different from everybody else oh yes um it's interesting, you know, you've, you've got to get the players to the, to the adventure. So, you know, they come in on a ship and they're, you're basically foreigners. So you're foreigners to a new land, which is always fun, that kind of theme of strangers in a strange land, right? So you don't know the mores, you don't know the, the social customs of the place. You get there and uh, you notice something is, is different than you might notice uh, or that you might know um, about your own lands, that it's a matriarchal society. So you quickly learn uh you know through uh encounters through things you witness in the book uh through characters you talk to that um you know it, it's it's a diff it, it may be different than what you're used to so that's kind of fun and it gives it kind of a foreign place like you're in a different place uh you know um we have a lot of great npcs the small boy he's on there right now we have a lot of great npcs um i really love the small boy um, I've, as Gareth said, I've run this with multiple groups. Some groups really take akin to the small boy. Others just kind of ignore him, and he's just an uh, uh, he's just an annoyance. But the boy is great because he gives you an idea of how the society works from a boy's perspective, right? Um, he has uncles, which are like he goes to his barracks, which is where the men stay until they're married. They then they go to live with their wife. Okay, um, where well then he calls them all uncles because you know, um, and he's he just it's interesting to see the society through him, uh, like how that everything's normal. And when they ask him questions, they like that he thinks they're, they're weird because they don't know how things work. So it's a really fun encounter. I love the kid, and he's actually not named in the book, so you can name him. I've named him Shrimpy. I've named him other names <laughs> with different groups. You know, just whatever feels fun for the group. Um, that's the kind of the name I give the boy. <laughs> and, and all these things you see on the pages here with these little titles, these little boxes, these are all basically answers to questions. So if, if a character asks about the boy's father, this is the dialogue that the boy speaks. So you as the GM can say in the voice of the boy, you can give the answer to that question. And generally, we we put all the answers to all the like most likely questions that people are going to ask. And in that, as the GM, if you've read through those, you can kind of pick up and then add your own little embellishments onto it if you wish, if your players have different questions about your world or something like that, which may, obviously, we wouldn't have known about um, when writing it. So, But there's a lot you can work with in here to sort of give the character um, a sense of voice and place. Um, and I think that's one of our key differences is this dialogue. Um, you don't really see this in published modules at all. Um, this is really, I think, how world building should be done because world building, the NPCs are what make the world. It's not about how descriptive you are about your mountains and your towns. It's how people interact with the people and what the people do and say that really builds the world. And that's our design philosophy in this. And that's why there's just so many dialogue options. And you'll see that in most of the characters, they'll you know they'll ask each character might talk about the taxes in the town because the tax collector's coming to town. And so each character, if you ask them, they'll have a different response because they're like the little boy doesn't know anything about taxes because he's too young to even understand that. But when you ask, you know, this lady in the village, you know, she has a has her own particular thing to do with taxes and then other people have different opinions and why they need to be taxed so heavily and so on and so forth so through asking the questions not only you're getting an answer about the topic that you're asking about but you're also getting a lot of information about the world itself so um yeah i think that's one of our key key differences here and then there's all these little notes that you'll start to find scotty what, what are these <laughs> we thought it'd be fun to add little notes because when um, I GM a module, I, I rarely run it as written. I always add my own things to it, and I'll write notes, you know, on the pages of the modules. Um, so I thought it'd be fun to kind of pre-do that to give you, you know, some things out of our GM heads, you know, what we would what we would think about or or notes we might take in the, 
in the text, you know, uh, extra information or what to look out for or, or what to what to think about. So I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really handy kind of little trick that we did there um, to add those notes. So here you can see it's been pre-stained with coffee. So you yeah, I love that. <laughs> pre-stained with the with the with the coffee. Uh, yeah, that's great. So in this, um, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of books in the local temple, and these are sort of extracts from the books. Again, just fleshing out the world. But it's not just a whole bunch of useless information to kind of like just talk about the world. Everything that's in here is somewhere in this book. So you'll either encounter it or find the remnants of it or it'll be important in some way. So there's nothing in here that's just for the sake of it being there. There's always a point and a reason for it being in the book. Running it, I found you know that all the dialogue op options. I I've written it, right? We've written it together. We've 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 read it multiple times. But just having all those dialogue options helps remind you um, of things that can be will be important in the module that you might forget or you might um, you know fail to to think about at the time when you're running the encounter. So it is nice to have those dialogue options, even for, even for an experienced G uh, game master or, dun or dungeon master. So here, the, just the first sort of mention of the warp ferret. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find that we we also reuse monsters throughout the. So we once we introduce a monster, it may occur several times in the book, but we always do it in a different way. So there's your you've got ah oh, we know how this monster works, and then they hit it again and realize there's more to it than they thought the initial time they encountered it. So we're always playing around with that sort of thing. So here we have notes again, a little post-it note that's really, really cool. Um, and everything is event-driven. So not the players won't see everything, but you as the GM, when you're reading this, we wanted it to kind of read like a bit of like a novel or a choose-your-own-adventure kind of book. So you're learning as you're reading. So we don't do any kind of summary of the adventure or anything like that because you can literally... Just pick up the book and start running the adventure and just page to where you need to go just tells you where to go. Um, and then everything you need is right there. So that stops you from flipping back and forth through a 420 page book. <laughs> exactly. I, and I love the layout of the book. It really helps uh, GMing the book. And that's that's one comment we've had about our modules that they're 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 easy to navigate. So again, this cool Scotty art here. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, there's plenty of cool characters. Like one of my favorites is the town drunk. Um, he um, he has a particular way of in introducing himself. <laughs> it's just absolutely hilarious. Um, and he pops up now and again through the story. Um, and you can, it's one of those things again. You can completely ignore him, but all the drunken nonsense he's talking. If a character is quite, or a player is quite astute and they listen to what he's saying, he's actually revealing like extremely important information. But he's so drunk that you like it's almost like it's encoded. <laughs> exactly, and I've had players who love that kind of lore. They they love looking out for those clues, and they got clues from oh didn't oh Balthazar told us you know he mentioned something about this or whatever. Um, and that's always rewarding you know when players <laughs> you know decode something out of his drunken stupor you know. <laughs> he said to them so then there's puto who's of the mountain clans he's a giant troll like creature um he protects the local tavern um and then you uh, you meet the local tavern keep uh who um thinks that you're doing something that you may not actually be doing and then it becomes this whole sort of um uh, misadventure <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a great description. It's kind of a yeah, definitely a misadventure. <laughs> so here we have some again. This is this is all terrain stuff that Scotty has photographed and he's painted everything and done all that kind of stuff. Um, so you'll find that this was really inspired, obviously because of our crafting channels where we wanted to use that sort of stuff in the book. But it's also inspired by like old white dwarf magazines and the, and the magazines from the eighties and nineties. That this is. This is how you experienced gaming for the first time. It's like you found these and then that sort of inspired you to to run the game or to play the game, etc. Um, and that's the feeling we wanted to try and invoke in this is to get, to get back to that old school um, feeling. 
um, you know, the old school style of art and everything, but it, with a new twist because of the way that we're structuring it and doing dialogue and that sort of thing. It it has that old school feel, but it's very different, definitely new. Yeah, that's a great, yeah, it has that old school feel, but it's a modern, you know, it's written for a modern audience. So I think we've really succeeded in that. So there's a significant number of options in the first, because the first module is really about introducing the world. So we try mm -hmm. to pack as much as we can in there. So, I mean, obviously this player's not gonna see everything. So we kind of have to bleed it in in different parts to sort of give them a hint of what's gonna be happening in the story. So, you know, a, a lot happens in Death and Taxes. Um, and if you were, if you if you if you just wanted to get a taste of what the modules like, you can purchase each of the modules on their own. So you can kind of get Death and Taxes and have a look to see if you like the style, and then sort of go ahead and 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 invest in the in the in the book itself. But uh, I don't. We we haven't encountered anybody who's you know had anything like really bad to say in terms of what, you know what we've put together so you know but i mean we're open to criticism we're open to sort of hearing what you have to say and what you have to think and so on and so forth in the reviews on our on our website but oh, uh, always you know um this is everything we've ever wanted from a module um we we sort of sat down and said like um what, what's normally in a module um, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's plenty of cool. Here's the warp ferret. Um, so there's, 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 there's plenty of differences to what you'd expect, but because we are GMs ourselves and we know how people want to run it, we haven't dictated what the stats are. We haven't dictated what levels characters must be. We haven't dictated any of that kind of information. What we've dictated is really flavor and theme um, and sort of how characters interact because we've kind of created the world um, which you can plug in your own things, um, but we haven't statted it out. So it doesn't matter what game you're playing, this will run in any sort of fantasy based system. Um, however, it, saying that, there have been some people who've run it in other systems that are not fantasy based. Um, and it, it, you know, believe it or not, it kind of frees you. Because um, I've run it in, you know, a D&D module seems to, there's a certain way that a DD and d module's developed and written and, you know, th you, there's a certain things you expect. Um, and without, when you write it like this, without, you know, being attached to a game system, it's all about theme. It's all, you know, it's it's all about story. It's all about uh, making interesting adventures, not not, you know, going by the rules, but going by what's fun, right? And so I've run this with, I've run it with D and D. I've run it with a cipher system. I'm running it with my own system, Easy D six DM Scotty's Easy D six when I'm developing. So yeah, it's that's it, it kind of frees you. I, I like the fact that it's system uh, neutral because it frees you. Um, and you don't feel like, oh, you have to kind of warp it from, if it's a D&D module, I want to run it with Cypher. You know, I got to twist it into, to work with Cypher. I, there, you never have that feeling with this, and I love that. It's freeing, actually. So we moved on. This is now the first quick quest, which is a sort of a sub quest. So each quick quest is, so has like a parent module in the book. Um, the Arcane Vault is sort of the child of Death and Taxes. So they, they work together um, and, of course, are part of the Grand Hole. Now, all, all the quick quests form like a separate little story, um, but tie into the main plot and also help to flesh out the world even more. So whether your players actually do this or not, it doesn't really have much of an impact except in the final module of the book where these sort of things can influence um, right. And it, and it gives you like, oh, crap, because it's like, um, you know, what's going on when my when I ran it for my daughter, she was like, well, that went to 11, <laughs> you know, because it's all this kind of like, you know, all this subterfuge and they're doing all this stuff, you know, and then they have this, which is like literally like encounters, you know, dangerous encounters um, and 
it was just you know it's just like whoa it's like a kind of a kick in the butt you know um there's something bad going on here really bad you know um i, I think it accentuates how bad that something is going on that you still need to find out uh and also this sort of terrain as a map so um we've got we've got that that's the cover of the of the module there um and that each one of these segments is a is a room in this sort of dungeon <laughs> um which um scotty has obviously laid out and photographed and then we've done some photoshopping and stuff on it to give it that sense but each thing that's in the model is in here um so uh that that's something that you don't see very often is actual terrain as a map um so that's something that's really cool we might do more of that in the future in future products and things so again, just the events that happen in the module, which of course there's not that many because this is sort of a single, a single session kind of adventure. Um, and there's quite a few sort of weird and wonderful things that happen in here that will really give your players a run for their money. And again, it doesn't matter what level they are. Um, you, you do the stats, so you decide like sort of how hectic it should be. I love this. Exactly, movie. exactly. Scott, Scotty's meat blob monster here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then we move to the loyalists. So each one of these adventures we've designed to be a different role-playing game experience. So the first adventure is really sort of the world-building introduction to the world and exposition. But this next one is more about um, political intrigue, you know, like there's two different factions in this and you kind of have to pick which one is telling the truth, which side do you want to be on? And we don't say which is the good or which is the bad. You kind of have to make up your own mind of that. Um, and um, your choice matters throughout the modules, but it's not like you chose incorrectly. It just sort of influences what happens in certain parts of the game. So that's the cover art that I've done. Um, this has uh, my favorite character of the entire book um, here and our favorite monster of Scotty's done the thing, but we'll talk about that when we come to them. So this is the city of Southwood and uh, this character Nera, it, it was introduced in the first module and you'll find Nera comes through all the, all the modules. Tell us a little bit about Nera and why she's in there, Scotty. Yeah, she's a very interesting character. I've had a lot of fun with her in, when I run it. And um, she befriends the character, and she's kind of this ambiguous um, character as, as far as, like, what, is she, what does she want? What are her goals, right? She never really articulates her goals to you, but she helps you, you know, in uh, substantial ways. <laughs> she helps you. So it's fun to have the character suspicious of her, but also kind of okay, let's wait and see, you know what I'm saying? And that's a really fun NPC to play. And uh, so you can take her as far as you want through this. You know, um, she, she runs through the whole thing. You can use her at will. She can pop in and out. Um, so she's like kind of uh, the game master's way to, you know, interact with the characters, um, you know, through an NPC. So uh, I, I think she's a really interesting character and she can be as useful or just use or non-use as you want, you know, uh, or as you need. And this this is my favorite character <laughs> of the whole thing. <laughs> this is like this is my sense of humor. This is like the kind of characters that I love to play and I love to DM and I love to write. So she's not a big role. She's a tiny part in this. Um, but to me, it's just like the, you could not take her out of the story. Um, and that's Ahobet, the Salakan hunter. This is old lady. <laughs> who rocks up in your campsite one night, just plonks herself down and starts smoking a cigar. And she has a satchel full of bombs. <laughs> and that's a, She that's is a, a blast of role play. She's a blast of role play. All her you know, dialogue um, is here. Yeah, and the dialogue's all there for you, all laid out for you. So you can have, you can have fun with it and embellish it um, and get an idea of how she speaks um, and how she interacts. Uh, so that's why I love I love that about the dialogue too. It gives you that sense of the character. But you have to do the old lady voice. Hello, dearie. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, you've got a nice little campsite here. Because if you do it like that, they think she's a hag, and they're just gonna like everyone's gonna be on edge. Like we're about to be attacked by this hag, <laughs> and she's a nice old lady. 
<laughs> yeah, she is. She is. She calls him Deary, you know, this and that. Um, <laughs> so she's she's super fun. So this is where we see the first bit of Scotty's sculpture art of the Sala Khan. Now, Sala Khan is, uh, well, you tell us, Scotty, because you, you constructed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Sala Khan is this just nightmare creature. It... Um, it lives under the ground, and it's it's essentially a large ball of uh, bile that you know just with an enormous maw, um, uh, ten, uh, tendrils that have you know uh, grasping kind of mouths and claws on the end that spit acid. So this thing is a nightmare um, <laughs> incarnate, uh, and um, of course it comes up in the player's camp, right? <laughs> so uh, and you're having to fight it with you know an Ahabot's helping you, and it's been so much fun. Uh, to see the characters, you know, uh, react to her. She actually has something besides the bomb. She has something special that to fight. She has a, something special to fight the Sar the Karn you may not expect, which is fun. And um, I've always had a blast, you know, with the fight uh, with Sar because she's like this this other element to the fight, uh, and it's it's always so much fun. And it's the thing is scary. Like this, this thing, every group has you know had a, a rough time with it, and. You know, it, it puts a little bit of terror in the players <laughs> when this thing bursts out of the ground. And part of our inspiration for this monster, if I just hold my finger over the end of the name there, you'll see where the inspiration came from. Oh, no, exactly. No names <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so here we got more of Scotty's um, great art. And the this is sort of now you're going towards this city of Southwood. It's a small, it's, it's more of a town than a city. Um and you've got to then get into town because the guards are running an inspection um, and you might be riding along in the tax collector's carriage. So you've got to like think on your feet and there's a variety of different ways of getting into the town um, that are that are great. And I, I love that kind of thing where there's a, there's a whole bunch of options um, and the way the, the world reacts to what you're doing um, is really important and it's not just the world it's the people because obviously it's the gods or the people of the world and how they react gives you an idea of you know like how the what's right and what's wrong in this in this environment right right you know but we've got it covered you know if you if you want if you like the the you know role-playing aspect and they want to trick the guards you got that covered there's other, you know like uh, gareth said there's other ways to get into the to the town which you know we got uh explained and all this kind of stuff so um you know, help with, you know, Nira could help you or not. Um, so just all this, uh, you know, whatever, whatever your group likes, if they like to, to sneak in through, you know, crawl through a, through a sewer, you know, or they want to talk to the guards, you know, we've got it covered. The Katerine, the merchant is also a very great character, her and her husband. Um, oh, she's wonderful. She's wonderful. I had so much fun role playing her, um, with the group, her, they, you know, her husband and her, um, Bishop is her, um, accountant and <laughs> she's always this woman is just lucky like she's just she's one of those people that just has enormous luck and um that's how she's gotten rich and you know bishop you know when she does these things she's like oh this isn't a good idea and then it turns out to be a great idea <laughs> so she's just perplexed you know that this woman makes money but she does um yeah <laughs> it's fun we begin to meet the different factions um in the library, we begin to find out a little bit more of what's happening behind the scenes in terms of the the the, the background plot of what's happening in this world. Um, and, that, and that cloak and dagger was a lot of has been a lot of fun to my groups. You know, doing that kind of cloak and dagger stuff. Yeah. So there's this as you can see, there's plenty of information in here. I mean, you're not you're not going to be wanting for f trying to figure out what to do, or whatever. Everything you need is right there. Pretty much any question that a, that a player asks is answered by a character somewhere. Um, so if you've read through it first, you'll have an idea of what the answer will be. Um, you don't need to read the entire book through in order to know, you know how to run it or whatever. You can basically just do each module and read each module first. I would suggest that you do read the module first. You could play it without reading it first, um, but... You know, I'd, I'd say you'd be about 90% efficient doing it that way. To be 100%, mm -hmm. just read it. 
So that each right, you just about, read it and you'll be yeah, you'll be good to go. So each one's only about thirty pages or so, so it's not, mm-hmm. it's not a, mm-hmm. like a huge investment of time. Um, no, you'll probably spend longer just on statting things. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so here yeah, <laughs> we have the pencil shavings in the book. <laughs> Again, more great Scotty um, uh, photos and of terrain and stuff. Um, and more post-it notes that give you an idea of different things you could try or how things connect um, that may Uh not be super obvious, but, you know, we outline for you anyway. Um, And then all the different political things sort of come to a head um, and you then have to get out of town. So that um, leads you through various things and you start to meet these weird and wonderful creatures here. Um, and yeah, the, you, you make your way through into the sort of caverns under town and you also then meet these creatures. So what are these? <laughs> Those are fun. You know, like we didn't want to have any standard monsters in the book, right? So we created Drex, which are, um, a, like a society. goblin, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the Drex of society, right? They're kind of a goblin. That, that was the idea for the name, but the, the Drex were kind of like, um, the goblin like enemy. Right. Um, but they have a few things that are interesting. They have, you can see the spines on their back so they can use those as a, as a defensive measure, uh, when they're fighting, you know, put the spines toward enemies to defend themselves. Um, so, uh, and they have these enormous eyes so they can see in the dark with their big ears. Uh, so they're really good in dark caverns and that kind of thing. So they're a fun uh, enemy. They're a fun, uh, interesting enemy that's, a, it's not just your standard guy. Go- oh, it's a, it's a goblin. Okay. You know, it's something a little more interesting. And, and because we don't give any stats, you can make them as powerful or as not as powerful as you like. So. Exactly. You can fit them right into your game system or what level you need. All right, so here we have the next quick quest, which is Blood Moon Temple. Um, and again, the terrain as a map sort of idea. So you can get at least see the layout of what, what it is you're about to go through. Um, and again, mm-hmm. this can easily be run in a single session. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I found that the regular modules usually take um, two to three sessions. Um, the quick quests are a, a basically a session yep. or less, yeah. So again, just outlaying the uh, events that happen um, and, you know, all the things. So we do actually have a um, map in here that has the, obviously the terrain map and then each sort of section is, is marked out. Yeah, we thought that was a fun way to do it, you know, with the terrain set up. It's just some of my art you may have seen on some of my channels. Um, and then obviously more notes and stains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's um, um, some interesting stuff going on in the Blood Moon Temple, and um, it's it's kind of like more of the underplot of what's going on, you know, that you don't see above, you know. It's the underside, the underbelly of what's going on. So that brings us to Messenger in the Woods. This is the third module. Um, and um, this is my favorite cover. Um, and just, it really sort of drives home what it'll be feel like sort of creeping through this forest um, with all the trees, but there's, there's like hidden details in here. Um, if you see the, if you're looking at the image, there's certain things that are sort of almost like, you can see them once you know that they're there, and, but if you don't, you can't see them. Um, which was a little bit tricky to do, but uh, I won't point them out. You'll have to look for them yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Again, sort of the page of, of contents of the module in terms of the events. So you can always refer back and you can see what page something is on if it tells you to go to a certain place. Most of the time it goes forwards. It's very rare that it goes backwards. Right. And we uh, we do an interesting uh, mechanic in this um, what it, what is it, Gareth? So this is the sun die. So we just sort of outline in this block here how the sun die works. Uh, and that actually tracks the time of day. So each each event that the, the players go to, it tells you how much to add to the sun die. So if the players are taking too long, they're running out of time. 
So at the end of the module, if they've got time left, there's certain things that can, they can get. If they've run out of time, then there's a whole section that they miss out on um, of crucial things. So um, it's a wonderful mechanic, and especially when you have it out in front of you and you're moving the die, the characters know that something is going to be happening. So it's like a, a not a t sometimes people use a timer in a room. They use like a D4, and in D4 rounds, something's going to happen. Well, this is like in hours. So <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> so it's really effective um, when used correctly to to let the players sort of force the players to move forward. So if you're running a game where you you want the players to do something by a certain time, this is a wonderful mechanic to to add in. And it you know it feels like you're under pressure. You know, um, sometimes it's hard to relay that in an RPG. But, you know, uh, that when they see that die counting down, you know, <laughs> it's like they know, you know, um, that they've got to get moving. So then there's the dialogue options. And then this person that you meet initially, they're apprehensive as to who you are. Um, and you kind of have to convince them that you're OK. Um, then we do some um, stuff with trees. So obviously trees live a long time. So they and they and they don't move. So it makes them very interesting as characters. <laughs> then we get introduced to bite bugs, which um, you find out more about them in the next quick quest. Um, but great monsters um, in this, I think, in terms of they're actually quite powerful. Um, and yeah, it sort of sort of add to the scariness of this forest that you're trying to work your way through. Yeah, they're terrifying, and what they do to the trees is like heartbreaking. So, um, it's it's a great a great RP great RP material, as well as combat. You know, literal combat. So, just characters in there. Here's some again great great sense of what it would feel like if you were going to make terrain. This is sort of what the kind of look that you'd want to go for um, to give that, the, the players that sort of sense of scale of how big this forest actually is. So at Enormous the beginning trees. of each section, you can see here, it tells you what to do with the sundial. Or events and events. And events so yeah. yeah. <laughs> first time, uh, well, not really the first time, but where we encounter, um, sort of unmasked hags. Yeah. They're sort of the stormtroopers of the of the bad guys. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots of weird and wonderful things. Again, great sort of um, top-down shot of terrain here. And this is where you get to um, different sections where you get, if you've got time, you can explore more and get more information. But if you've run out of time, you kind of have to bypass a lot of this cool stuff um you meet another sala khan in a different sort of orientation <laughs> I yeah, won't right say, i won't say anymore <laughs> uh, nope <laughs> um and then yeah so you get to your destination and of course depending on when you arrive um and who you're who you have with you and things like that makes a difference to how everything plays out um which is really cool. I think, you know, that's one thing is that you, you get given the sort of the roadmap as to what you need. So it's not really railroading. It's it's more giving you a sense of how this should work. So if you're a new GM, it's, it's really going to give you enough information to play. If you're an experienced GM, you can see how it's supposed to work and then you can work around it if you need to um, because you'll know sort of how to twist it and tweak it. But you probably won't need to. So, you know, it, it, it works both ways, which is really good. Oh, totally. Yeah, exactly. It's great for a new or old game masters and DMs alike. When the sun die hits zero. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> it hits the fan. <laughs> See, here we're coming back to... Um, back to... Um, the Winter Bay Town Drunk and Nero, so they always popping up here and there. So this is the next, the next quick quest, Belly of the Beast. So Scotty, tell us a little bit about this module. Yeah, this is a really interesting one. Um, it's 
Um, you have an encounter where um, you could possibly fall into an ancient dead Sarlacarn. And um, that's where the blight bugs are coming from. They're, they're holed up. They have a nest inside this thing. And another interesting thing is you meet a uh, Drek who's floating around inside this thing after you fall into it um, and actually ends up helping you. You know, um, more likely, I mean, if you're not aggressive to him, he'll help you. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting t twist on, you know, a bad guy who helps you because he's been stuck in here for years uh, and, you know, um, he's built up a little island from the Detrius has, has fallen in to this thing. And um, we actually have a cool kind of um, fantastical backstory for the Blight Bugs that is like a, a sci-fi kind of thing. Uh, and that's really interesting and a surprise for the players when they encounter and realize this. You know, um, of course, their characters don't really understand the science fiction, but the players do, you know, um, they understand that there's something science fiction going on here. So that's, that's a fun twist to the module, I think. Uh, and also when we do dialogue, it does it in the voice of the, of the P of the person of the NPC. So it speaks the way they would speak. So it's not just what they would say in the normal thing. It basically speaks the way they would speak. So you get a sense of how this girl, I will talk this way. <laughs> You know, <laughs> <laughs> and that's really fun. That's really fun to play that, you know, that you can actually say in their own language what they're saying to you. And then if someone can translate or knows what they're saying, um, then they can figure it out. So that's that's fun. I love I love that. So you don't have the immediate understanding of the character. So, you know, then then it allows you to like, I don't understand what this little guy is saying. Can I use a check to like use my knowledge or my wisdom or my whatever my knowledge history or my knowledge languages or whatever to figure out what this guy's saying? And that's if he's speaking common. Now there are sections in here where the actual that it's it is speaks the actual language, so you get the what to say in garbled nonsense of we've we've written the language for you, so you don't have to figure it out. But then it gives you the translation underneath. So you can then, um, if they do pass their check, they can figure out what they've said. And if they've only done like a partial success, you can give them, give them the gist of what the guy was saying or, or give them slightly wrong information or whatever. Um, so we've taken all of that into account. So you don't have to think about how to speak the crazy language that this thing speaks. We've given that to you. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes when you come up with it on your, you know, just out of the blue like that, it can sound ridiculous. <laughs> so it's fun if you have at least something to go, you know, it's something to read um, that's that's a weird language like this, you know. It also gives you a sense of how it should sound if you were going to do a voice. Yeah, um, yeah. Which I don't think I've ever seen anywhere else. Um, so here, here is his little hut on this floating thing inside this dead Sarlacan. <laughs> you see the walls of the Sarlacan there. That's like the ribs. You know of it um oh, that's, desiccated uh, that's wylock if, if he looks familiar <laughs> <laughs> and homage to wylock so more of scotty's great sculptured creatures and then the queen of the bugs so that brings us to knights of old so there's a um there's an order of knights that are that protect the queen and her family in this realm. Um, they're called the Swords of Honor, and so this module kind of goes into them and what they do. And um, you can become a Sword of Honor, um, and to do so, you must complete four or five <laughs> quests. <laughs> And that's fun, too, because you either become instant allies of certain people or instant enemies, right? So we instead of having, like, the traditional thing where you have a puzzle in each module and all that, so we just put all the puzzles in one module. So if you want to, you can skip it. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but, it's, but it's definitely, you know, we thought about this, like, it's a fail forward. Yeah. Like, there's never a point where you can't, oh, I can't figure out this. We just can't figure this out. Um and the game just grinds to a halt. I never, I've never had a problem with that. Um, but I've also we have it so it's set to fail forward. So if you do have that problem, it's not it's not an issue. You can just keep going forward. And it's fun. It's, it's yes. Oh, totally. Yeah. The, the, the players have loved the puzzles. 
we know how irritating puzzles can often get so it's like with the fail forward sort of thing um and and one thing i just want to note i'm a player who always goes i want to taste it so i do actually put in here what things (laughs) taste like or what happens if someone licks it um because i am just fun which is fun (laughs) (laughs) which is fun i've had i had people do that yes um (laughs) And the puzzles, you know, they can be kind of – sometimes they're kind of dry or they're, they're not that interesting. These all have great role-playing stuff in the puzzle, um, except really for the box. But the box has things – the first puzzle has things that, it, that you figure out and it shows you that make it really interesting and fun, right? Um, the others actually have role-playing elements, which keep the group interested – in the puzzle itself you know um and they're they're just they're just fun role playing because it's taken out of context it's not like oh we've been doing all this cloak and dagger and that's how it is each each puzzle each puzzle is its own kind of you know world in itself so what what the things are role playing you with you only only pertains to that little piece of the world right it doesn't pertain to anything else so that's really fun that it's just kind of jumping to these different um puzzles that are like separate uh instances or encounters um that that aren't connected to the rest of the world per se yeah and what's nice about that is like you don't feel like if you don't solve the puzzle you're not going to get to go to the next part of the story which is usually a frustrating thing each one is very frustrating because it, it it feels separate and it feels like something other than what you would normally do in the world um, and it is a challenge because that's what it's it's pitched as a challenge. You need to you need to f- undergo these four challenges to become one of them. <laughs> um, right. So you know. Oh well, we failed. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, you 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 don't. I don't think it feels as sticky as puzzles normally feel in modules. Right. And what's fun about the Swords of Honor is it's kind of like a retirement community for for the Swords of like for knights for knights who have done their service um it's a special enchanted protected place that the the swords of honor go to retire so it's essentially like a fantasy retirement community (laughs) you know so that's a fun element too um i actually had a character playing in my game he had to leave the game for uh personal reasons it was like he just couldn't play anymore um you know it was a work thing so he um he, we got to this point, and he retired and like stayed with the Knights of Honor, uh, which was really fun, a run, really fun story element, you know. And they had a tearful goodbye. The players got their tearful goodbyes, you know, and the other players went on up the North Road, and he stayed with the Swords of Honor, which was a great way to end him leaving the game, you know, he, that he's with these with these uh, awesome guys. So, uh, yeah, really fun. And what's 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 nice about it because each of these modules is really a separate adventure that could be run on its own that doesn't necessarily oh, totally. need yeah. to be part of the rest of the adventures you can have characters come and go at certain points um and and the party moves forward through the campaign so there is the ability to do that um and the character of nearer is something that sort of helps along if a certain character is not there or has wandered off or you know the usual things that you do when someone can't make it um that's she can come in and assist as uh, as that you the extra character you need for whatever your game system requires in terms of balance exactly this is scotty's baby death becomes you oh this is a fun one. Oh, oh man i'm telling you <laughs> and that is this actually is scotty one. in the road by the way <laughs> it is it is <laughs> So we we had we decided to for this one we decided to have one there's one last challenge that the knights have you do and it's optional it's an optional thing they have this nightly they have this thing that they do at the in the night and it's like this procession uh, to a capstone that they have and you just send down this crypt where these um, revered swords of honor are buried and you have very a very strange encounter with something called the grim and the grim is a some kind of being um, that can travel through the dimensions and time itself. And so you actually have adventures where you um, 
do different things. I don't want to give it all away, but you do different things that have to do with your past. Uh, one thing I think I will give away, it's just fun. You could actually change something bad that you did that you regret from earlier in the campaign, which is so fun. Like the players actually did that and they, there was something they, they had done they regretted um, and they went back and fixed it. And that was so cool to do. Um, but there, the other ones are just as it's just as fun too. The other kind of mini adventures in, in the in this are are just as fun, and can be dangerous actually. <laughs> That's Jeremy from Black Magic Craft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's me. So we do include people we know <laughs> that peppered, peppered through right. here. Right. So even the titles will give you a sort of dark assassin. The Grim mm -hmm. Battle. Mm -hmm. So you know what kind yeah. of stuff's going to happen in that module. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Now it was we have very, very interesting. Dark City, which is oh. sort of gets to, This is sort of the middle and the meat of the bones. If if this were the adventure, this would be the dark dungeon of hell that you've descended into. And this is like, if, if there was a literal Nazi hell in this game world, Dark City <laughs> is where it's at. And the city's name is Fusterberg. Um, and... That's the title of the first event. Um, but there's so much sort of oppressive, um, like what it's like to live in an author authoritarian society and trying to escape that reality. All the things that those kinds of societies do, they do to you and the people. Um, so there's all kinds of things that are happening. And the idea is for the players to try to get out of this um, and to get through this city. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful sort of city as a dungeon kind of scenario where you've got to go through various areas to try and get, get through. There's lots of wonderful characters in, in this module. Um, most notably is Jig, um, who's, who's, um, uh, another one of my personal favorites. Um, but it takes you through how you enter, how you approach, um, how you approach the city um, and how you encounter like the money changes and how they sort of are going to control every aspect of everyone's life including the kind of money you're allowed to use so and how they punish people we even go into what it's like to smell the place the smell that's <laughs> right. happening in the city so yeah. everything you, you need is in, in here and of course the pit of death I mean how could you not <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you can see it's an enormous Sarlacar and that they're sacrificing stuff too. You know, it's they're sacrificing um, you know, lawbreakers too, which just about anything is a law, you know, breaking the law. Um, cuz they have a they we have a crier at the front gate, you know, saying what's what's punishable by by death and it's essentially almost everything. <laughs> you know, except breathing. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, there are plenty of, of the smell. <laughs> yeah, there's no end of people that they're sacrificing to this thing, and you can see the crowd in the background. Um, but yeah, it's so that just shows you um, the moral fiber of the society. It's broken down. It's you know, there's none. <laughs> you know, there's none left. Um, and that's what that's what I like about it because then it accentuates the people who help you. Those small things where someone gives you a kindness um, really stand out because of all the horribleness around you. Right. And jig is one of those characters. There's also like a weird fantasy cybernetic cat in here, but we won't. Yeah. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you are into crafting, Scotty actually has a video on his channel about how to actually make the Sarlacc. I do. Yes. There is a Sarlacc the Karn video. Yes. So if, if you're into that and you, and of course it's not like you build it once and never use it again. As you can see, this is about the fourth or fifth time it's appeared, and we're only on page two twenty-five. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we meant it, we meant it when we we mean that monsters come back. Yeah, they they, they make multiple appearances. The the Drex, we have three D printable models of the Drex, so you can actually three D print the Drex, paint them up, and and of course, because they use throughout the modules, you can actually use them again and again. So mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and they make quite cool little fantasy miniatures anyway. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. So lots of dialogue options in here and coffee stains. <laughs> of course. Of course, why not? Um, and then um, uh, from from earlier, Puda shows up too. 
yeah. so that's interesting. And you can you can kind of decide how you deal with it. Or you just you can just ignore it. You can kind of um, my my party actually helped Puda, and he's part of the group now. So that's that's really fun. And the dame circles are really great. I love the idea of there's different dames that control circles of the city, and they're literal burrows of the city that circle in towards the mountains, right? There's a wall between each burrow. And uh, Dame Fury is kind of the warrioress, you know, the warlord um, dame um, that controls uh, her, her burrow. And uh, well, well, there'll be a different dame for each, for each circle. There's Dame Arcanus. And she's kind of a mutant. She has four arms, so she can cast two spells at once. Uh, deadly opponent. Um, and uh, they, in her circle, they can learn more about what's going on. They can see more what's going on. It's more in the open what's going on with um, this magic that they're channeling. Um, you still don't know why, but it's um, it's it's you know some big project they've got going on. And uh, we even have a mini game in here called You Betcha. Oh yeah, you're better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can play this. You can play this. My character, my uh, my my uh, my adventures didn't play it for the last adventure, but um, yeah, you can you can play it. It's totally playable. There's all the rules right there. And what's good about that? You can use it in other games if you wish. It's good. whenever you have characters. I've always got a player. He always goes to the tavern. Always wants to be gambling. Always wants to double his money. Uh, this is a great little quick way to do almost a poker style game with dice. Mm -hmm. um, and there's rules on how to cheat. And like you know, do do tests to see if someone's cheating and all that kind of stuff. It's all in there on just this like one and a half columns. So um, it's uh, and even like multiplayer, you bet share and how you can play multiplayers instead of just one on one. But it, it, it's a great little thing that's in there. Just one for flavor and two you can reuse in other games. Um, and it's a simple simple little side side thing. <laughs> totally, totally. Oh, and the man himself, Doug Scullery. <laughs> Which comes from my favorite word, skullduggery. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Which kind of says it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, you meet him basically in passing here, um, but more about him later. Um, yeah, definitely. There's, there's more on him. Uh, and then you get to the sort of main core of town where you have to meet uh, this thing <laughs> and we'll just... right the relig religious fanaticism um going on and you've got to wonder what so. kind of religious fanaticism creates this thing exactly uh, exactly we just it's call probably it... not good right <laughs> this is all you need to know it's the beast <laughs> right <laughs> all right and then at the end of each module, we tend to have um, a little bit more information and a little sort of additional information. This one doesn't because there's just so much in it already that it doesn't really uh -huh. require it. And all the additional information from the previous models module still applies anyway. So um, although we do repeat sometimes certain bits of information, like at, at, at some point it's like, well, it still continues on, especially the wizard weed, which starts in module one and permeates throughout the entire book. Um, but we just mention it less and less, but it's still there. And yeah, it's, 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 been, a, it's been a strand through the whole books, and it's a very interesting element. It's this drug that um, the bad guys are using. They've, they've, they've super hyped it up, so it's like uh, really addictive, uh, but it has a devastating effect. Um, but the effect is not just death. It's to use the corpses... Uh, for something that they're uh, this magical thing they're doing so it's an interesting i think way to use something like that and we say bad guys we mean bad girls <laughs> yeah bad girls yes yes <laughs> bad girls bad girls what are you gonna do <laughs> so that, that brings us to mountain clan uh now this module is heavily influenced by nursery rhymes and fairy tales um so and, and it's one of those things like is this where that nursery rhyme or fairy tale came from? Um, and how sort of what one terms a primitive culture, how like that may not actually be the case um, and perceptions of different cultures and how your perception may actually be wrong. Um, and what you've heard and been told about people may be wrong. Um, and that's kind of like the basis of what, what this module is about um, as you go through the mountains north of Fusdeberg. 
Yeah, I love that about the module. It's 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 uh, great. So lots of cool little things here. Um, great. This is one of my favorite terrain pictures that Scotty's done. Oh, thank you, thank you. I have told him this before. You have. <laughs> this you is have. not the first time I've. Told <laughs> no, him. no, it's not. But hey, I can bask in it, right? <laughs> And then so Puda belongs to these people. He's from these people. And so, you know, uh, if you if he goes with you, he, you're taking him home, essentially. So that's really fun. Um, he, he finds his place. He's never had his place in the society because he's not like the rest of the people. But then you can finally find his place. And it's really, you know, that, that's touching, I think, um, if you take him with you. It's all kinds of rituals and things. There's always kind all kinds of things happening in the background so like yeah in the, yeah in the second module there's like a, a festival that's going on because of the blood moon that's about to happen and so all that kind of thing it's the backdrop of what's happening in the module so it's not just bumping into some characters there is actually world things happening all the time it never stops the world keeps going whether the characters do anything or don't do anything it's things are still going to happen exactly and you know the play when you meet these people like um, you know, through their through their dialogue, through what they're doing while you're ha you're in the village, you get a real a real sense of who they are and what they're what they're about. Um, and we do that for every place in the book. Um, it's really something we wanted to bring forward. So the little red riding hood wolf thing, you've got the troll <laughs> yeah. living under the bridge, like the all troll this, on the bridge, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all the sort of thing again here. Now we bring back the concept of the trees and the tree, you know, the tree folk. Um, who aren't ants, so they don't get up and walk around. They they no. don't move, um, mm. and how sort of that you know that affects. And now you might be able to see these little creatures sitting on here. And we talked about the warp ferrets earlier. And we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it yeah. at that because yes, yes, <laughs> you, you'll, you'll meet this one. <laughs> yeah, yep. like I think the title here gives it away. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> So then, um, you know, the concept of Snow White and seven guys. Yeah, well, this is really fun. This yeah. is a really fun. Um, the, these are those seven guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we talk about um, we talk about a, a, a lizard called a Guamji. I think it's in this module, which is a, like a it's a very poisonous lizard that lives in the mountains, and that actually comes into into play later. Uh, in another module, it might be the next next module, yeah. uh, but it comes into play. Um, but the name Guanji I got from um, I'm a big Ray Harryhausen fan, and so the movie uh, The Valley of the Guanji that's what I got the name. From. That's where I derived the name from. <laughs> the Guamji. Finally, um, you tell lizards. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Guamji lizards. <laughs> and of course, all the terrain type stuff. You know, if you like Ray Harryhausen films, it's like I, I'm a huge Ray Harryhausen fan. Oh, so, me too. You know, like animated skeletons is just they, they, like, oh, can we do that this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You can probably see all my camera set up and everything at the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, yes, we can. <laughs> then we meet a character that's talked about in books and by certain characters throughout. Um, you actually go into her tomb. Yeah, this legendary maiden. There's two legendary characters throughout this book, um, mm -hmm. and you do actually encounter them. And so um, they yes. help to give you an idea of how the world was created and all that kind of stuff. But we don't sort of spell it out. We don't say, this is how it happened. This is what happened in the history. No, it's kind of, you see the fingerprints of what's left behind and then you can kind of figure out what's going on um and right the, the lot of the political intrigue and the way that society operates and whatever is as a result of what these people have done in the past um and so that's how it informed the theme of what we're doing but we we do not spell that out in here in any way shape or form the only time you hear about it is when we talk about it um but you see the results of all of that. And I think that's a really great way of doing it because it still leaves it open for someone else to give their own reason as to why it is that way. Um, exactly, so the char exactly. The, the characters make up their own history of the world. Um, and I think that's much better, a much better approach, um, in my opinion. Um, 
and um, and opinions are like noses. Everyone has one. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, when you get to things like true death god. <laughs> There we have The Sleeping Maid and Great Aunt by Scotty. Thank you. Um, this is my favorite piece of art of Scotty's, which is the cover for Thief. Um, and um, so, but before we get to there, so this is, there's like a, a this little map. Um, and that map is actually one of the books in the first module. It discusses a page that's torn out. And this is the page that was torn out. <laughs> so <laughs> right <laughs> you know like when we say like anything that's mentioned is actually important information it, that's how like you know it will come back somewhere it, it's in there somewhere and if of course we've left something out you need to let us know because we, we scoured through this thing with fine tooth comb <laughs> right right making sure we got everything cross referenced and everything so thief what type of module is this scotty <laughs> this is a fun module this is a module that um, some may think can't be written. Okay, <laughs> this is a murder mystery module, and you know, believe it or not, it's really hard to do a murder mystery well, right? Because either the players figure it out too fast, or they get stuck, right? You, it's usually one of the two. It's rarely that everything goes along like Columbo, <laughs> you know, and he, 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 you know, he trounces them at the end. That's, that's never how it goes. You know, if you ever run like a mystery, a murder mystery, this one, the, the structure of it has made it work so that it will, it will always work. Um, and I, I love that. I, I think it's, um, I, I think it's a great idea. And I think it's fun because it's not something that people are going to normally see because either they've, they played a bad murder mystery or their GM knows that they're, their trouble so they never run one right <laughs> so um you can actually have fun playing a murder mystery in this one a lot of great characters um including a dog <laughs> by the way <laughs> who so, is my second favorite character in the scratch group. the dog <laughs> Serious, scratch the dog. right he's the first person you you bump into in town and there he is in all his glory um but what's the most interesting thing about scratch the dog this is his dialogue right but the dialogue is all body language so it tells mm -hmm. you what the dog does when you ask him questions like who's a good boy then <laughs> right <laughs> and the dog actually responds a delighted wolf and a roll exposing his stomach while his tail swishes the gravel on the path about the place he pants with excitement but there's an actual translation of what he's saying so if a person knows how to commune with animals we actually give you what he's actually saying <laughs> Right. <laughs> and there's like really important information that can be revealed yeah. in here. So if you can speak with animals or something or you're a beast master or something, um, you could actually get the other information uh, more than just um, the body language. So, yeah, we, we thought that was fun. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm Scratch and I'm such a good boy. I'm so good. We can definitely be friends. You look like <laughs> such nice people. I'm so good. We are friends now. Friends, yes, so good. <laughs> And I love the name of the hamlet, Wiswaddle. Um, yeah. Wiswaddle. Um, it's a great, like Fusdeberg. You know, it's yeah. a, it's not your common, your common fantasy name. You know, you know, like um, that you'd expect. Uh, and I think that's fun. So yeah, scratch scratches throughout the module. He's giving you advice and telling you what's happening and all that sort of thing. But of course, it's just as, to everyone else because they don't speak dog. He's just an annoyance. <laughs> yeah, nobody else likes scratch. <laughs> He's just kind of an annoying dog. So um, that's fun for dog lovers because then you immediately don't like those people that don't like the dog, you know? Um, so, yeah. Nira is still here. So we always give a little paragraph about Nira and if she says anything or whatever. Um, exactly. Nira, there's, there's, there's always some blurb. Mm -hmm. Scotty's little posted about Scratch. <laughs> Murder. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Um, and you, you get sort of the incompetent police force. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, if you, if you, if you're going to be, um, if you're going to be Sherlock Holmes, you're going to need what's, uh, what's the incompetent police officer. Well, he's incompetent by comparison to Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> right. Um, oh my gosh. Um, it'll come to I me at three in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. I can't think of his name. You've got the scene of the crime. 
you, you begin to meet the people of Wiswaddle and the, you know it's one of those things where they're basically all horrible people <laughs> Right, right. It's this like idyllic little town with horrible people in it, <laughs> <laughs> which which plays with our whole concept of the world is 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 the NPCs. So you know everything is described as idyllic, and then you talk to the characters and they're all horrible. <laughs> and uh, there's something else interesting here um, uh, as kind of background to the town. The guards um, in throughout the game have been able to show up, just show up uh, because they have these seeds that they can eat that make them invisible. Um, and until they, they, they exert themselves, they can remain invisible. Right. So um, this is the place where they actually harvest those seeds. They grow in the mountains and this is like the perfect spot to grow them. So they grow them here. So the, the town is very well to do because they keep the kingdom furnished with these invisibility seeds that the guard, that the, the constable or the guards use. And so, um, yeah, that's an interesting aspect uh, to the village too. But also they don't know that that's what they're growing. There's only one person who knows that that's what they're growing. The rest of the exactly. town just kind of like feeds off the profits. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Old Marble, which is our take on Miss Marble. Who's yep, yep. Ir irritating person who keeps giving her opinion on who's guilty. <laughs> 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 and instead of the washer woman with the washer man because it's a yeah. the society is is um, um the matriarchal, matriarchal society, society. Right. and the sleeping guard i love that <laughs> in the and, picture there <laughs> and scratch's investigation because scratch has done his own his own legwork exactly exactly and of course doug scullery shows up again ah bastard and that, that again scotty's art that is doug scullery Mm-hmm. Some masking tape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So even if the book's falling apart, if you add masking tape, it just adds to the aesthetic. <laughs> it just adds to the the, <laughs> the ambiance of the book. <laughs> right, then Temple in the Mountains. So this is basically a module where you're assaulting a stronghold. You're chasing chasing a character, assaulting this stronghold. Uh, and then once you're in there, you've got to sneak around and do all kinds of nefarious things, hoping not to get captured. <laughs> of course, here are the events as on every module. The approach to the stronghold, and you meet a guy on the outside. Of course, it has Nira again, just giving you a little bit of information if you're still using her. Sort of a nice sort of... Um, image here again of Scotty's terrain different ways of entering so it's not just one route in you can sneak right. in you can fight your way in you can like f um, find secret passages all that kind of stuff and then um, we lay out the module as in like you can almost roll a dice to figure out where where someone is going so if you want to do your own map and you want to just add these numbers in you can um, and you will then be able to um, add them in. So we've even got additional ones that where we don't we don't actually flesh them out, but you can just add them in anyway um, if you want to make a bigger map. So you can really design. We've done it in a way you can design your own stronghold. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You just need to put these in wherever you want to put them in. And of course, right. you've got places like Death Lurkers and Death Wheels. Um, you can, <laughs> <laughs> and the death lurkers are something that come back from earlier in the modules um so that we something we didn't really talk about but yeah they're 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 another show up again monster <laughs> it's the first time we see craigors as well this is a craig but we're always adding stuff um and yeah. craigor is another example of that so it's these kind of um flying um lizards or gliding lizard uh lizards uh so they're pretty dangerous that are trained. So it basically just goes through each section and what can happen there. Um, and then eventually um, you, uh, Doug Scullery's back, um, you get to some of the important locations um, and the party may, may be captured and end up in an oubliette. And then things that they did in the second module can then help them out. So right, right. There, there, there's um, all that sort of things go back and forth, back and forth. Um, everything you do kind of has has some kind of consequence. Um, right. And uh, 
this in this module you you meet the princess um and this character is um there's an interesting twist that happens here um but um we'll sort of leave that to when you actually read it um right that brings us to inner sanctum which is really a fractured reality um so which is really super fun yeah so essentially this mountain collapses and there's all this magical stuff that's been happening below the mountain and everything just gets ripped apart and you've got to kind of try to make your way through this fractured um collapsing reality um so it's very much almost like a maze um but not an irritating maze (laughs) right (laughs) Yeah. And what I like to think of is like the Poseidon adventure, right? You know, where the ship capsizes and you got to make your way to the top. It, it has that feel to me, um, except there's magic and, you know, crazy stuff added on top of getting out, you know, of this, of this mountain that's collapsed. So you got to find the right passages. You got to find, you got to get past these challenges um, where magics collided with each other and created uh, dangerous events. So, uh, or interesting events. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So what's interesting here, I'll just talk about on the events page, you'll notice that each one of the events here has a number, but it's going down from 20 to one. And that's because of the way that we've structured it when they're walking around, you first start rolling a D20. And the reason for that, the way we've structured it is to make it more maze-like, you as the GM roll a D20, and that determines where the characters go when they go through certain parts. Um, and you think, oh, well, you just keep rolling a d20, you might just land on the same place six times or whatever. So what we do, each time you roll, you then roll a smaller dice. So you start with d20, then d12, then d10, d8, d6, d4. Um, and that finally leads down to um, event number one, which is then how they can scramble out. So they may find it very quickly, or it may take a long time for them to find it. So... And of course, you as the GM, you don't have to do it that way. You can just pick out the ones you like and put them in that right, order. Right, exactly. And if, <laughs> yeah. If you're replaying it you, or you want to make it bigger or whatever, you can add in your own ones. Um, you can add in your own events and things in here. So it's a great way to just structure something which you can reuse. Um, so oh, yeah, totally. Because of the nature of this book, uh, you know, Scotty's run this many, many times and you know, you can reuse this many times with many different groups and it doesn't really get tiring as you know, because otherwise you run it once, you don't really ever want to run it again um, because people will approach the material in different ways. And if you've got a group who's done it before, you can run through this again and it's not going to be the same route. It's not going to be the same layout. So you can reuse this whole module if you wanted to multiple different times. Oh, totally, totally, totally. So basically the rest here is then from 20 all the way to one. It then just goes through the variety of different events and circumstances that happen within this fractured reality. Um, There is one little puzzle here. So I lied when we said we put all the puzzles in (laughs) there. And, you know, one interesting thing about, about it is like this place has been of religious significance since the making of the world. So it has these just massive deep caverns and tunnels and, and places and they're all different styles and from different eras and you know uh, and, and then you know you jumble it together when this cataclysm happens so uh it's there's a lot of interesting stuff in here so if you could just think about you know certain cities like they took london and all the different periods of history that have occurred in that city now imagine you just crushed that up and stuck it in a blender and now that's the reality you're walking through um that's exactly that's a great analogy like. yeah, yeah. that's a another, great analogy we've got another salakan in there uh oh yeah in here. <laughs> um death lurkers which we haven't really mentioned before but they are from previous modules um there's a, a Drek temple. Um, there's lots of Drek. There's a whole Drek village in here, actually, which is yeah, really yeah. interesting. Um, but yeah. always with a difference. So it's not the same ones that we did before. There's, these ones have a difference. Um, and it speaks to the sort of history and culture and all those sort of things and how it differs from region to region. So always something interesting. And then there's just sort of um, uh, the final sort of thing as you're getting out of of there which this leads on to on the run 
Now, this is one of my favorites. I ran this at Mace in North Carolina when I was in America. Um, everyone had a great time. It was a, a bit of a watered down version that I played in that because I had to do it all in one session because this can actually can actually go over a few sessions. But the great thing about this module is it's just one giant chase scene from beginning to end. Um, so you imagine being on the bus in speed. That's that's what this module is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Careening on this. <laughs> well, you'll see. <laughs> So it starts where you, you meet a character from one of the previous modules in here at the, at the top of this mountain. Um, and the only way is down. And you basically find this cart and your only way of escape is to use this cart to go down the, the mountainside. Um, and the, why would you want to do that? Because there's a giant death wheel coming down <laughs> after you. <laughs> and the mountain is literally coming down. So, right. Correct. And the mountain is <laughs> collapsing. So you gotta get your butt off the mountain. <laughs> here, here is a um, a wonderful craft by Scotty. I'm just hoping this thing will clear up here. There hey, thank you, man. There's a wonderful I'm very craft proud of by it. Scotty. You can actually see that being made on his channel. So it's this mm -hmm. giant, like water wheel powered by Drex running around in a circle, like hamsters in a wheel, with these witch hag things on top throwing magic at you. So it's not like, oh, we, you know, we just need to get down the mountain quickly. You've got this thing that is literally trying to kill you coming behind you called a death wheel <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like speed with something chasing you <laughs> that's right so imagine the the in indiana jones with the big j rolling boulder coming behind you but the rolling boulder had spikes and mad people on the top that are trying to kill you with magic that's what this is <laughs> yep so we also have a new mechanic in here called the distance die so it basically as you do things the death wheel gets further away or closer to you um, and you use a dice to represent this. So similar to the sun die we talked about in the in Messenger in the Woods. Uh, this is, again, something you can use in other games if you're doing any kind of chase scenes in a sci-fi or modern or something like that, or even in a fantasy game, you can use this to great effect. You know, even you're having horses chasing and all that kind of stuff, uh, you can use this same mechanic to um, to help you out in those. And you know the whole idea with it was, was to fail forward, right? If your if your characters are having bad rolls, just make it more harrowing for them. You know they they don't necessarily crash the cart. It's you know it's just getting more and more dangerous and more harrowing. Um, so that's you know that's fun. Uh, that that's fun. So you don't you don't crash in the first. <laughs> you know you turn the first corner and you smash the cart and you're done. Um, you want to you want to fail it forward so it's just it's just more and more oh my god you know <laughs> the problem is just mount 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 and um yeah just it just makes it more exciting you know um, so here on the page is a note on failing it forward um so yes, this, yes. this is this is something we you know as we've talked about in the rest of this video you know, this is something we as quest givers always take into account that you must fail forward not like you fail and then the whole thing is over thanks for playing um, right, <laughs> exactly. You know, you, you'll never encounter anything like that. And then each of these little dark sections here are just telling you how you adapt the distance die when things are happening. Um, again, another great piece of terrain art here from Scotty. Let's see, clear it up. Um, with the death wheel chasing the cart. Now, as, as you know, the cart gets bashed by the death wheel or hits by blasts or whatever, as the cart starts breaking up, you, you lose the brakes or a wheel comes off or <laughs> all that cool stuff happens in here. So everything- And Gareth can tell you how exciting that is with the group. You know, they oh. were just worked into a frenzy, you know, like just one disaster after another or just trying to like, just trying to hold with spit and glue, hold this thing together, man. It's just like, it's just, it's really exciting. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, and fun. It, fun. it really is fun. Uh, it's and it's one of those things like you you lose track of time because, <laughs> you know, I I obviously played this with seven D system. I didn't play this with D and D, but with seven D system, it's like it's it's very much uh, you 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 gain experience through doing things. So by the end, people have gained tons of experience because of all the stuff they're having to do to try to keep the cart running and trying to keep the death wheel at bay and. <laughs> All these sort of things going on. Um, D and D, obviously, you're going to have to use a, a wider range of skill sets and things, um, and knowledge, and and all that kind of stuff to kind of keep the cart on an even keel, so that you don't go running off the edge, which does actually <laughs> <Right>. happen. <laughs> 
like you know here here you go the rickety wooden bridge what horrible stuff you could like <laughs> oh not that you know <laughs> <laughs> that happens. The fallen tree. <laughs> Not that. The no. Room, that, yep. didn't, <laughs> that everything didn't that could possibly go wrong. <laughs> and of course, we come back with silicons as well. The, the, the silicon patch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which there we and, go. There's the picture. We're just trying to <laughs> grab the. Just trying to grab them. <laughs> a quick meal. <laughs> if you pass. It's a drive-through meal. Uh, yep, <laughs> for it, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're the drive-through. <laughs> um, and then you've got the collapsed bridge. So like, that's oh. that speed. I had to have the speed thing with the, the, the bus. That ran. <laughs> but how how do you actually handle that when you're in a rickety old cart? <laughs> right. It's so it's so evil fun. It's so evil fun. And then um, <laughs> the final piece that's held together with masking tape. Right. <laughs> it seems appropriate. <laughs> so, that, exactly. And of course, from that, uh, you then go into Grip of Evil. Scotty, give us a bit of a summary of what this, what sort of, what sort of role playing experience is this? Oh, this one is fun. This is like, um, uh, a, like you're in a horror mansion, right? Like you've gone to the haunted, the haunted house on the hill or something. Uh, it's yeah, it's just a lot of. Thematic flavor and um, you know a turnaround of the plot because it, it, to me it's kind of like up to that point the the, the story's been kind of going up and up to that point that the princess was the main villain and then things kind of change and turn on their head and then it's a whole different dynamic and this this is really uh, the start of that and the and you know gets you on a different path maybe so uh, it's it's just a lot of fun and. Um, yeah, it's 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 a wonderful adventure. Yeah, there's a, a uh, you have house on a hill, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so all the tropes that you like from movies and all the kind of you know like exactly the, there are a lot of intertextual references in here that if if you if you love all the stuff that we love, it's all in here somewhere. It may not be blatant, but it may have informed what's happening. Um, so yeah, it just. If you love all that kind of stuff, it, it'll it's all not just in this module, but the whole book is like that. Um, yes. You know, yeah. Um, so like and we want, in, you know, for instance, Dark we always City. want to have these things dripping with flavor. You know, we always want everything's everything's flavored, you know, um, Dark so. City is like when they've just escaped from um, the great escape from the from the in World War Two. They've got yes, out of the prison yes. camp. And now they're trying to make their way through to the border. That's the feeling you get from Dark City. And it's like, you know, so all the totally. sort of horror movie tropes and everything are in here. So like, <laughs> it's a it's a psychological nightmare. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And then there's creepy old Merc, who really is creepy. <laughs> yeah. He's been there forever. And there he is. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> that could be literal and figurative. <laughs> exactly, exactly. When you when you have a title, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know you're in for something. You know you're in for trouble. But there's a lot of great creepy uh, encounters in here um, yep. that callbacks to the rest of the modules, um, kind of things. So um, yeah, fun stuff. Fun stuff. You know, the whole idea of walking around in this creepy old place at night with a lantern. Yeah. Exactly. Of course, you have to go to the basement. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. It's like, why would you not? <laughs> and the uh, the possessed princess, that's my daughter, Dana, a picture of her <laughs> that I modified. <laughs> so. so it's all the people we know and love. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> And then the last module, White Castle. Oh, yes. This is where it all concludes. This is where it all comes together. This is where everything you've done comes either to help you or haunt you. <laughs> so this is essentially a, a, a giant battle that happens, right? Um, you know, as, as if a, you know, a castle is being assaulted from all sides, from different factions and all kinds of things. Um, and we introduce another mechanic here called battle progress points, which is you, you go through various 
um, parts of the castle helping out in the battle because a lot of times you know mass combat is you know kind of done with one dice roll um and yeah. you know and then so the whole battle is over in a few seconds but we wanted this whole module to be this constant fight that's happening throughout this castle um like and a running bring, battle yeah yeah and it brings in all the elements of everything we've done in the rest so um everything that you've done in each of the modules kind of gives you either it either helps you or hinders you in each of these sort of battles that you're going through um and you get these battle points which basically you accumulate more points for winning or losing various different battles and in the end those points kind of determine how you're viewed or you know how the outcome is resolved etc um so that's an interesting another little mechanic that can be used elsewhere Again, great terrain art by Scotty here, with a little photograph. Um, and uh, there's lots of dialogue options and things in here as well. Um, plenty of notes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Swords of Honor. Yep, they come into it. You got all the factions. So all the different locations, the dungeons, the courtyard, the ramparts, the battlements. The bar the floating, the Sar towers. floating Sarlacarn, which is like, you know, a, a siege weapon. You know, this is like, um, yeah. If it could, Sarlacarn could get worse, how would it get worse? Oh, yeah, make it float and it can move around. <laughs> <laughs> so then you've got like the Kragors and the Drex and all the different the blight bugs. So all the oh. sort of monsters that you came across, you've learned how Everything to you've run across, right? Everything you've learned to fight, everything and whatever is kind of in this giant battle in the end. Um, so we throw everything at you, including the kitchen sink and the whole kitchen. Um, exactly. <laughs> the kitchen sink attached to the kitchen. <laughs> but, but done in a way that it's there's actually a point to it and there's a reason yes. why the things were happening in the previous modules. It kind of makes sense. Like, why were the Drex helping? Why were the sister of the Dark Brotherhood or whatever, you know, why were they doing what they were doing? And, you know, um, all that comes into play in informing what actually happens in here. So... Um, and then eventually you get to meet the queen. One interesting thing, um, we, we have the mountain clan in here and the mountain clan, as you, you, you learn about them and you speak to them and you uh, uh, participate in a ritual, you learn that they're about the balance. They're about the balance of things. One side or the other, if they get too powerful, that's not good for the world. So the mountain clan will actually come in on the side of the side that's, that was losing, right? <laughs> And they'll actually help the other side. So that's interesting. So they may they may have been your allies before, but now they may fi be fighting you. So that's an interesting element to it um, with the Mountain Clan. And I, I think that's cool because um, when people think of alignment, they they don't necessarily think about that. They think of like, oh, it's your evil, evil or good, right? Um, chaos or law. But these, you know, they'll actually help the side that's losing. So I think that's an interesting aspect to them. Yeah, it's sort Into of the a, battle, a close to a true neutral. Um, I always see... Yeah, it, and it may be unexpected. It may be, it may be unexpected by the players that, oh, they're helping yeah. them. <laughs> they're not helping us, they're helping the Well, the true side, neutral so, is very yeah. difficult to define. True neutral could actually be a psychopath. It is. A psychopath is true neutral. They, they do neither evil nor good because they're only doing whatever they want to for themselves. The perception of what they're right. doing is, is evil or good, but what they're actually doing is true neutral. Um, so there's various right. different definitions of what true neutral actually is. And I think balance is one of them. Balance is one true yeah. neutral kind of state. And you don't see that very often in, in D and D you don't see things that are actually true neutral. No, you don't, you don't. And then we have at the end, the appendix. So this just gives you more of a background into the society of the North road and um sort of the background that we basically put together to sort of give us an idea of what should happen when they interact with various parts of society and whatever and it's really just a couple of pages just to if you're interested um here's yeah it's it's not long um yeah. uh and it you know can help you understand the society um quickly it's it's kind of like the writer's bible where you know you you write what what the show should have and is about and you know it's it's a it's a it's a very concise version of that yeah 
And there's obviously um, some of your pencil shavings <laughs> from 1986. Hey, did you leave your pencil shaving in the book? <laughs> and then uh, just our thank you for, you know, purchasing the module. And, you know, we hope that you have as much fun running it as we had writing it. Um, and that's just a, more of the cover art because obviously it gets cropped on the cover. And then there's all the modules um, on inside back cover. So there's all the modules in this book. And then there's some of the extra ones we've done, which is the collaboration with Black Magic Craft, the collaboration with um, Dungeon Craft, Professional Dungeon Master. There's Scotty's Great Weirdly Strange Night of Terror module. And then how <laughs> to run a successful role-playing game campaign, which really is our blueprint for how we actually wrote all of these. So if you want to know how to actually write in the style, you can actually go to our website and we have a little PDF that's very cheap that you can basically um, follow uh, follow along that and um, create something like this, which we feel is wonderful. You, you, you know, it's, I, I don't think there's anyone who will be unsatisfied with 80% of this book. You know, you're going to, you're going to get a lot from this material. Um, yeah, what's that? Four hundred thirty-four or four hundred twenty-four pages. You're getting a lot of material yeah. uh, in those pages, because think about it. There's no synopsis that's wasting pages. There's no stats that are wasting pages. Think about in a module. Half the module is that, right? It's the synopsis in the in the monster stats. So you're getting this is all content. This is pure, you know, content that you're getting. Um, so it, it's a great deal. It's a great deal. And hours and hours of fun. Well, you could take this is an entire year's worth of role playing. Definitely, definitely, easily. easily. Oh if yeah. You're, if oh, you're yeah. playing every week, you might get three quarters of a year, but still, that's a lot. <laughs> There's not yes. many other things that are <laughs> going to give you that much gaming in. So, um, and uh, we just got some review blurbs on the back from people who actually p purchased the modules prior to us printing the book. So we just thank you for their. Um, kind words um, and um, just a we don't really even summarize what happens here on the back <laughs> <laughs> right right and, and if you'll notice we didn't tell you what happened at the end we kind of got past that um, we want you to find out <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. the surprise at the end so we didn't we didn't tell you that but um, yeah it's it's an interesting ending it depends because there's different different ways it can end <laughs> oh totally yeah totally so depends yeah, totally depends on the players right so. so this was a lot of fun putting together um thank you to everyone who actually helped us make the physical book by backing our kickstarter it is available as a pdf as well or you can get the book and the pdf together um and yeah we just love to hear your thoughts either in the comments or as reviews if you were a kickstarter backer you can actually go onto our website using the email address that you use to back a Kickstarter and give your own reviews on, on the work. Um, if you've purchased the PDF or anything like that, you can review on our site. So thank you to everyone who's watching. Obviously, you know, this is quite a long video. Um, if you've gone through all the timestamps, you know, you can thank you for checking us out. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I feel you'll be very, very happy with this investment um, in this book because it it not only is a great module to run through, there's lots of cool ideas and things that are useful in other games. So, Oh, totally. And, you know, I love the size of the book. It's a perfect portable book, um, you know, that you can take. It's easy to take with you. Yeah, it's that's part of our design concept as well, is we don't want the book to be something that's unwieldy or problematic or we've tried to remove everything that we feel is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right it, right and make it cool and, and useful so um, give you the best experience running a game that you've ever had um yeah. and we've had we have had comments on people who love the way we design modules that they're so easy to to navigate um and that's what we really want to do because i that was one of the one of the ideas that w when we started this quest giver saying let's make these modules you know for the game master for the, you know that they, that they're it's easiest easy to run as possible and laid out in a you know uh, a logical and useful way and it's aesthetically pleasing exactly yeah. right right it, it's a whole package the whole package goes together uh but yeah that's you know 
And if the book gets damaged, it still looks like it should have been that way. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And also, um, it might be a little harder for Gareth because he's in Australia, but if you see me at any conventions, um, I'll probably have copies on sale. Um, I'll sign them for you. So, yeah, or if you have your own copy, come up to me. I'll gladly sign it. I'll gladly sign it for you, and I'd be, I'd be glad to sell you one and sign it for you. So, uh, you know, as, as COVID kind of lessens here, I, I have plans to start going back to conventions. So um, I'll see you there with, with North Road. When, when Australia eventually lets us off the island, I can go on an <laughs> adventure. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you very much for watching Quest Givers, and thank you very much for wading your way through this page view. Um, and we um, really thank you very much for your patronage. It does sort of help us to make more of this sort of thing, because our next one called Hidden Valley We've already begun on, we've started art assets for it. Uh, we've got the structure all down. We've begun the first module. So everything in the pipeline is still coming through um, and it will be different to this one. So it's not going to be more of the same. It, it'll be more of the same in terms of our wacky adventures, but it won't be the same in terms of what you'd expect. So oh yeah, this again. is this is even more unexpected, right? Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. See ya. Take care, everybody.